بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Welcome everybody back to Behind the Minbar Blueprints for a Better Masjid And alhamdulillah we are very honored uh, to have Yaqeen's editor-in-chief And uh, a distinguished historian from the University of Toledo Dr. Ovamir Anjum with us Welcome Dr. Ovamir Thank you for having me Zakallah khair Akramak Allah Sheikh I know that alhamdulillah you've, you've made a long journey to be with us And uh, you have a jam-packed weekend But we just wanted to not lose out on the opportunity to work through, I know, a uh, a subject that is mutually uh, occupying both of our minds all the time. And I think anyone with genuine concern for a community and global community, the Ummah, and, uh, and its needs at the moment. And so we wanted to speak about how do we come together, Sheikh, mm. the unity um, in and between Masajid. But of course, the analog to that is the unity of the Ummah at large. Mm. And so... Uh, I'm going to dive right into it uh, and speak about when w- there's a lot of Muslims that already know this, right? It's the elephant in the room. Uh, maybe some are losing sight of the necessity to be united in this hour. Uh, so maybe we can begin there, Sheikh. Like, how, how do we diagnose? How do we think about um, someone or a, an idea, not a person, an idea that that we can do without coming together, putting our hands together and multiplying our force as an ummah or as a sort of a local ummah. Yeah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ar rasulillah. So I'll begin by reminding ourselves that this is part of our iman, very fundamental level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He commands iman, He commands unity. وَعَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْ لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Right, so you ho- have to hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing so together and not being separated. Like, and this is the really fundamental command mm. that you cannot do one without the other. If you want to hold on to ro- the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to do it together. Theoretically, if you try to do it on your own, alone, you will have many deficiencies. And if you are not trying to overcome the difficulties that come by uh, the difficulties of being together, being in a jama'ah, being in a family, being in a group, being in a masjid. If you're not confronting those difficulties, then your iman is deficient and you're going to be tested and you will either uh, succeed or fail. And uh, uh, this is how your iman is going to be tested. So, and Rasulullah began this at the very basic level. The relationship that we have between two individuals, Rasulullah would say, and this is one of the most beautiful teachings uh, in our deen that I love, which is if you love your brother for the sake of Allah, you tell them something as simple that. So I want to tell Sheikh Muhammad, mm-hmm. I love you for the sake of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah. May the one for whom you've loved me love you. I mean, no. The response is very awkward in English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So that's, that's uh, one of the most beautiful teachings in Islam. I find Indeed, in the suluk that the Prophet Sallallahu is just open, opening us up. Mm. And for us introverts, it's kind of hard. So it's really, I feel the blessing of Islam in the way that maybe some extroverts who are saying this, you know, all the time they don't feel. Mm, but I do. So uh, Iman, as soon as come, Im- Iman comes, the, there is a responsibility to love those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why, of course, it's part of um, halawat al-iman. You cannot have sweetness of iman except if you love Allah and His Messenger, the famous hadith I will not repeat, but Allah, Allah and Messenger, you love number one, number two, you love someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that itself is the cure that if you're going to taste the sweetness of faith, you have to. Uh, start reaching out to other people who love Allah and start learning from them, start seeing them. Um, the famous important hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, Al-Mu'min Mir'atu Akhi. So even for like spiritual purpose, you're doing a muhasaba, you're doing a tawbah, what are you thinking about? If it's hard for you to think about your own faults, think about the faults of other Muslims. And I'm sure your brain is going to go crazy. Mm. Like, yeah, you, well, I'm looking, thinking about my faults, my problems, my sins. I can't, you know, list uh, one, two, three. 
and done. I don't have many sins. But then I start thinking about what other people are doing, right? What are my spouse, uh, all the other people around me, how annoying they are, how they always fail in their responsibilities. And, and then it becomes your responsibility to, when you see in the mirror that uh, other believers are around you, in that mirror you correct yourself. Hmm. Um, and in one of the beautiful uh, teachings in Imam uh, Abu Ismail al-Harawi al-Ansari's uh, book, Mandanzi al when he talks about muhasaba, self-reckoning, hmm. um, he says, وَمَا عَيَّرْتَ بِهِ أَخَاكَ فَهِيَ إِلَيْكَ Any dhamb, any sin mm-hmm. by which you shame your brother is to you. It's coming to it's you. It's en route. It's en route. Mm-hmm. So one of the teachings, there's a hadith about this, a hadith that does not have uh, isnad, a good isnad, but the meaning is that if you shame your brother with a sin, you will not die except that you will have fallen into it. Mm-hmm. And psychologically, that is very much the case. The projection is the psychological name for that. Uh, the sin that when we when you feel, project on others, it increases your vulnerability because you're not vigilant about yourself. Yeah, you. I mean, we project. This is what riba is also about. It's 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 uh, if you will, itching a it, an itch that we have uh, within us that we want to do something and we uh, project it onto others. So all of this to say that. Iman and uh, unity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they start together from the very beginning and they go all the way to the end. Meaning that uh, no matter how high you reach, there you're always going to have this test. Let's say you are among the awliya Allah. You're going to find somebody else who is also very close to Allah and you, you, you see them and they disagree with you in something. They have a different route, different interpretation. And they seem to be taking some of your, you know, air. Yeah. So uh, if you cannot be a, a good brother or a sister for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, you have uh, difficulty with uh, holding on to your iman. Yeah. Uh, SubhanAllah. I, uh, so I'm hearing that no matter how strong you get in your your faith, your iman, the appetite will still remain to, yeah. to lose sight of the honor of the believer, the imp- the sanctity of the believer, the importance of uh, of unifying or the sort of the injunction on us to the enjoinder to unify with the believers. So you're saying that the first thing we should look at if we're f- sensing this unity in our ranks is a spiritual ailment. Absolutely. It's spiritual. It's always your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of all the causes of disunity, um, there is baghi. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions baghi in the Quran whenever Allah mentions why the people before us went astray. Mm. They were given the book. And after that, all was supposed to be perfect. They were given the book. Yeah. So what happened? Ikhtilaf came. Ikhtilaf became baghi. It led some of them to transgress against the others. Hmm. And there's a subtle difference between baghi and udwan. Udwan is to do something uh, that is wrong fundamentally. Whereas baghi is when you're doing something that may be okay in it in limits, but you cross the limits. Hmm. So, so you play out your differences in the scenario beyond sort of where you should be, you are allowed to. Exactly. So mm. you are defending the right position. You're defending... In your haq, head at least, yeah. Right? In your head. Or maybe you are. Maybe you are. Right? But you're going to cross that limit where you where it will no longer be just about defending the haq. It has your hadh, your part, your nafs becomes involved. So you are defending the haq and then your hadh, your own yeah, self. Yeah. And then... Next time you're defending the haqq a little, little less and you're defending your part, your honor, your status, your institute, a little more. Hmm. And then this baghi continues to cross. And it's all this time in your mind you have the dalil. Subhanallah. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of Dr. Dr. Abdul Hakim uh, Murad. Uh, I saw one of his sort of like aphorisms floating around. 
He said the most dangerous thing in the world uh, is the ego hiding in the robes of the spirit. Mm. And it was very, you know, the man, mashallah, has a way with words, hafidahullah. Uh, and it reminded me very much, Sheikh, of uh, a, uh, a senior uh, scholar in the UK whose name I will not mention. But while I was at Medina, he was visiting for Umrah. And uh, he, without stereotyping here, because that would defeat the whole purpose of the podcast. <laughs> but he admittedly has seen so much strife in the da'wah back home, right? And, you know, perhaps especially at Umrah time, you're sort of recollecting and reflecting and sort of like uh, trying to be a little more honest with yourself, reviewing your life. And so he he was invited to give us a rooftop reminder, mm. uh, just the English speaking, you know, Medina students. And we sat and one of the things he said to us and he just broke down crying. And that's why I think it really got carved in our in our psyche. And I hope it remains. But he said, brothers, believe me, just all everything else, the details on the side, the sort of the ta'seel and the ahkam and the ayat and ahadith remain where they are, sacred, and they're the ultimate reference point. But just believe me, mm-hmm. more than anything else, the most dangerous thing in the world is ilm without iman. Mm-hmm. It becomes just ammo for the ego. Mm-hmm. And you, you look back 10, 15 years later and you realize it, if you realize it. Love and I, I felt, we all saw and felt the pain in his voice that... Uh, that even he had regrets about certain directions that he swore were sincere. And I think, uh, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah, he has this famous dichotomy of where this unity comes from. He says it's just jahl or dhulm, mm. dhulm being baghi here, right? Like transgressing. He said either you don't know the truth uh, or sort of you're overplaying mm. what you think you can do because of the truth that you wield. Yeah. And in reality it's two types of jahl it's like the jahl of your nafs leads you to to sort of uh, letting the animal within <laughs> out right yeah, yeah. don't keep it on a strict chain or jahl of the deen and maybe sheikh if you'd like to share with us the idea of people uh, like having misplaced concreteness as dr hatim always says the idea that you know uh, a certain parochial understanding or scholastic position without nuance right is mm. equivalent to something that uh is tantamount to ridda disqualifying your la ilaha illallah yeah. that's that's like a big issue from what i feel that people just don't know the difference between you know a secondary tertiary issue mm. a fundamental issue or the most fundamental of all like iman and unity upon our iman yeah subhanallah so this is uh, a, a, a you know every way of life comes with a characteristic set of maladies, diseases. Mm. Iman, which is the purpose for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the world. Mm. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. That is the purpose of creation. That's the best thing in the world. And yet, the believers have characteristic maladies, characteristic, disease, characteristic diseases. That mm. people, if you are a pe- person of this dunya, you don't know that stuff you don't suffer from the same problems. If you're not going after al-haqqa, then you know you are going to disagree with people on different grounds. And that's why it's very important, I believe, for Muslims, uh, young ones especially, thulab al-ilm, people who are seeking righteousness, people who are seeking knowledge, people who are on the right path. Hmm to understand that they are going to be exposed to certain viruses, certain diseases that come specially for them. And this is why Ibn, Ibn al-Jawzi's Talbis Iblis is such an important yeah. book. The guises of shaitan. And mm. he talks about the guises of shaitan, the disguises that come with ilm, like pe- two people of ilm, the two people of tasawwuf and tazkiyah, and to the people of The fuqaha. particular snares of every subset of exactly. like committed Muslims. Exactly. This is how he tricks the, the, the combatant. This is how he tricks the hadith scholar. This hadith is how tricks, scholars, yeah. yes. So uh, it's very important, and I don't hear enough discussion among us. Uh, starting with myself, I need that reminder. Oh, okay. So... Um, among the Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or among the people who were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this man is not a known Sahabi. Somebody, he comes and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is known for Adil. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is 
the standard of adil, right? And yet this man says to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Muhammad, inna kalam ta'adil, i'adil fa inna kalam ta'adil. Muhammad Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, be just, for you were not just in how he was giving out ghanaim. Hmm. And this was the discretion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He could give them according to Mu'allafat al as he wanted, as he saw fit. This is part. But he did not, he wasn't pleased with that. And he spoke in the name of adil, justice, something that has been taught that's the, you know, mizan, that's ba- on the basis, the basis on which Allah has created this dunya and this deen. And yet he used that against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prophesied that from among this man's uh, progeny, not biologically, but yeah. his likes. His ideological be, descendants. His ideological descendants. Yeah. There is going to be certain kind of people that later became known as the Khawarij. The Prophet ﷺ doesn't name them the Khawarij, actually. The Prophet describes them. Uh, the word Khawarij later, of course, became attached to them, but they were proud of the name because the Quran actually uses it in a positive sense. But um, It was a campaign of valor to walk out sort of valiantly. They walked out on the Muslim community and excommunicated them. Right, but they yeah. continue to say that we are the Khawarij because the rest are Qawaid, they are Qa'ad. Right. Cowards. Um, but what's, these were the people who began to attack the Sahaba. And I've done some studies of, of them and their character and their arguments. Mm-hmm. These are people who are known for their piety. And the Rasulullah describes them that they will be people who's, when they re- recite the Quran, you will think your recitation is nothing. And they will pray and you will think your prayer is nothing. And they will fast and you will think that your fasting is nothing. And yet these are people who are... Um, when they recite the Qur'an, it gets stuck in their throats, doesn't go down, meaning it doesn't affect their hearts. And um, this was a characteristic problem that we got. And this comes out of iman gone wrong. It yeah. does not come out of nifaq. So when people said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu wa ardah, that these are people of nifaq, he said this nifaq is what they're running from. How can they be munafiqin? Look at their prayer, look at their fasting. It's a different kind of disease. Hmm. But yet, there's it a is semblance a of sincerity there, but it was sort of hijacked by yes, other they, things. Right. So, that's in a sense, they were the characteristic example of what happens when you try to go for iman but lose its lawazim, yeah. which is unity which is to see in other person and have good thought, husn al-dhan, love for people who have uh, good in them, even if you disagree with them. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, of course, in Surah Al-Hashr, uh, the example of the believers, Allah lists the believers, the first come the muhajireen and then the ansar, and then those people who come, الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, and this is the example of all the believers. So there's a generation, there's a muhajireen, the immigrants, and then the ansar, and then all of the believers Till who come the until time. the day of judgment. How does Allah measure them? How does Allah describe them? By their dua for the people who came before. Hmm. So unity isn't even horizontal. It's even sort of vertical. Absolutely. Because that... I mean, that, subhanAllah, that's that, powerful, Sheikh, absolutely. that puts you in your place, first of all, and you are grateful to those people who have passed the deen on to you, and uh, you make dua for them. Jazakallah yeah. khairan, Sheikh. You know, you reminded me of uh, when you mentioned the Khawarij. Uh, even, because the Khawarij is like the easiest example of deviance. <laughs> Yeah. Non-controversial, I guess, yeah. in in this day and age, at least, uh, for the for anyone who would be listening to this podcast and any mainstream Muslim would agree, right? Yeah. Uh, even some of the uh, the ideological uh, sort of persuasions that have gone extinct and have been abandoned by the Ummah may still have you know uh, uh, a layer of of credence, um, or but the Khawarij are just like iconic. You know, lost the you know lost the ball, 
and yet the Sahaba still understood that because of the fundamental faith they had, mm. they were still entitled to a share of unity. Uh, you know, I remember in the Hadith in Sahih al Bukhari. I forget the na- the name of the uh, the narrator, but he came to Uthman radiAllahu anhu's house, uh, and if any listener sort of wants the quick context, Uthman radiAllahu an is the Khalifa now, so he's he's the most religious human being on the face of the earth. He's the most pious human being on the face of the earth at the time. And they laid siege to his house, calling him a sort of an apostate and a disbeliever. And they're basically deliberating and about to uh, assassinate him. Ultimately, they do. Uh, may Allah be pleased with him and raise his rank in, among the martyrs. I mean, but then a man comes to his house. He sort of makes his way through the siege to visit him and consult him. He says, he says, yeah, I mean, Anta Imam Muhammad. You're the big Imam, like a Khalifa, you're literally Mr. President. And we pray behind an Imam of Fitna, meaning the Imam of my local masjid is of those who calls you kafir. And we're sort of undecided on uh, what should we do. And so Uthman radiallahu anhu, subhanAllah, talk about spiritual purity uh, and still seeing la ilaha illallah as heavier than whatever we disagree on. The la ilaha Allah we do agree on. He said to him, Inna salata khayru ma yaf'aluhu nas. Prayer is the best deed uh, people can do. فَإِنْ أَحْسَنَ النَّاسِ فَأَحْسِنُوا مَعَهُمْ When people do good, do good along with them. وَإِنْ أَسَاءُوا فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا And if they do evil, then be ready to not participate. Have the pious restraint there, not across the board. And then they kill him, رضي الله عن, and yet Ali ibn Abi Talib still lives by the same principle. Like mm-hmm. initially he said to them, I will not, uh, when they kept protesting in the masjid, right? He said, I'm going to promise you three things. I will not prevent you from praying with us. I will not prevent you from partaking in the military campaigns with us. And I will not uh, take up arms against you. I will not initiate arms against you so long as you don't take arms against us or sort of uh, cut people off on the roads, massacre people in the streets. Mm-hmm. And this, you know, s- spiritual spiritual work is unending. And of what we get from this sheikh that I, I want maybe segue to our, our next question is that spirituality, spiritual survival, unity is necessary for it in more ways than we can discuss here. But now even the the, the, the insight and the foresight and the vision of Ali radiallahu an in terms of like uh, social, national, the civilization survival, right? That we cannot allow the momentum of Islam to stop. Nowadays we're talking about sort of rebuilding it even, mm. right? Even greater necessity for people to see past their differences, not for your own individual spiritual survival, salvation on the last day, but people think we can do without this. Like they think we can pull it off. They think, uh, they think, and, I, and I'm gonna be sort of crazy controversial right here and Sheikh shut me down if I'm wrong, that the Sunnah plus the Shia and potentially even others along with us are Allah is enough. But in terms of numbers, mm. political strategy or sort of like c- civic, you know, the common good for society, all those numbers still add up to a sum of a minority. Right, Sheikh? And so how far can we go, in your opinion, in terms of putting our hands together for the common good with people that are relatively closer to us than others? Mm. Let's leave it that wide. Yeah, uh, so if, if you allow me, uh, Sheikhna, I want, to, I want to say that even with the Khawarij, the word Khawarij became historical. Um, and of course, as you know, the Ibadis, who were seen as the most moderate of the Khawarij, mm-hmm. continued, um, and they exist in you know Oman today, mm-hmm. uh, and and some in the Maghreb. Uh, they are Ibadis, and if you look at their actions, their worship, they are moderate. They're just like rest of the Muslims. You know, I have no. They're not what comes to mind when we read exactly. about the historical Khawarij. In fact, they are very pious. Mm-hmm. So I don't. When I think of that, so basically, in in our tradition. The just people, our just ulama, mm. make this distinction is that just because, you know, they may have a distorted view of history, but they themselves have become moderated. And, they, you know, they rewrite some history. They, you know, they may still Revision. say that, okay, you know, Uthman was wrong and, and so on. But it transitions at that point to a different conversation. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but they are in 
you know, they may have a different story, but they believe in Allah and believe in the Messenger. And if you look at, they use a hadith. Are they pious? Yes. Do they feel the same toward other Muslims when the Muslims are hurting? Yes. I know this because I've interacted with people in Oman. Am I going to say that they are, I mean, I may disagree with them on their aqidah or, or, or certain historical interpretation, right? But otherwise, they're very close to the sunnah. Um, so just because the ancestors of some people said or did something doesn't mean all of that is accumulating for them because people change their doctrine all the time. Some of the great ulama that were students of Ibn Abbas had opinions that were in agreement with the Khawarij. And you find their riwayat in Al-Bukhari, in, you know, we're reading Tafsir, Tabari, Ibn Kathir. They had sympathies with Al-Khawarij. But did, they did not themselves have those particular sins or errors. Uh, and the ulama accept them. In fact, the ulama of hadith say that the Khawarij do not lie. So they may they have many problems, but they are not lying. Because they Prophet believe Sallam. they've left Islam if they lie. Therefore, we can trust that they're being honest when they narrate a hadith. Whatever their reason, mm. but that's not known about them. Right. So the point is that this is the extent to which Muslims go in uh, forgiving and overcoming these differences. So on now the issue of us as uh, Muslims, whether in, 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 in the United States, in the West, or across the world, can we come together um, and ought we, to, how should we understand our, um, let's say, wala wal bara? Our layers of loyalty. Our layers of loyalty mm. and disavowal. And disavowal. Um, this issue, by the way, goes all the way back to uh, earliest uh, sources we have on Islam. If you read Ibn, Abu Hanifa's uh, book on, you know, there is some d uh, disagreement on whether attribution. Uh, his attribution, but regardless of that, um, this was written in a generation after Abu Hanifa, the latest. Mm. Um, we have wala for everyone in accordance with their uh, iman and actions, whatever they are, they are good, and bara to the extent that they are uh, in uh, disagreement or are fallen into some heresy. But wala still exists. We can disagree with certain things, but agreement exists. And there is a quantum, if you will, I'm using this word, there is a bottom line, I should say, mm. bottom line of solidarity that comes with Anyone who says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And that's the main point I want to make, that we should think of this as a hierarchy. Hmm. The top of the hierarchy is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Anyone who says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, there is a bottom line of rights and duties that are established right away the minute you say it, and they don't go away until somebody denies saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, or something very obvious hmm. that... Uh, uh, cancels that out. So this reminds me. I'm sorry to cut you off, yeah. Sheikh. Please keep your thought. But it reminded me. I think uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani, uh, rahimahullah, he said, "How can you not accept as your brother someone that Allah has accepted as His servant? Yeah. Right? Like if he's bare minimum, baseline iman, la ilaha illallah, nothing should crowd that, or else your problem is actually with Allah, not with this brother of yours. Right? Yeah. Subhanallah." And what tends to happen is that we look at some, you know, you know, people turn, you know, people become particular schools, and some of those schools become more and more narrow, regional, and so on. And so the person who agrees with my madhab, and then the my part of my madhab, and the particular uh, alim, and the particular interpretation, a particular neighborhood, you know, people become more and more. Uh, you know, narrowly uh, affiliated. Uh, this is a famous joke in India. Mm. So uh, there is a man who is um, um, drowning. So somebody uh, saves him, right? But as he's saving him, he says, wait, are you a Hindu or a Muslim? 
He says, I'm a Muslim. He says, Alhamdulillah. He says, are you Hanafi or non Hanafi? He says, I'm Hanafi, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I say, okay. Oh no, stop answering. Are you okay? So are you are you a Diobandi or a Bareilli? He uh, says, yeah. I am a Bareilli. He says, Alhamdulillah. He says, Are you Bareilli from this firqa or the other one? He says, I'm oh. from the other one. He says, Oh khalas. He lets, lets him go. go. Oh my god. This is so this is a joke that tells you that um Sectarianism. It's artificial sectarian. Right. Yeah. And um, I'll tell you this. This is a sad story, but it tells you where I'm coming from, why I think this is a an ummah-wide problem. And in some places, there's it's less, alhamdulillah, and some places it's more. Um, I'll make fun of my own people. When I I'll visited, think of an Egyptian joke as, okay. you're, as you're sharing. <laughs> uh, I visited Pakistan, I think it was six years ago, uh, I went recently as well, but this is when I went there on the newspaper. I saw the news that um, one alim was a Brailwi, He had given the fatwa that a range, uh, a group of uh, uh, Brailwis had become kafir. They needed to make, uh, you know, they need to come back to Islam and renew the nikah, the ni- renew the marriages with their wives. Yeah. Why? Because they attended a janazah. And in that janazah, a Diobandi led Hanafi, Diobandi led the prayer, and these people prayed behind him. And according to his fatwa, for praying the, in that janazah behind a Diobandi, they all became kafir. So he, they had to go and uh, renew their iman and marry their wives again, because, of course, when you do become a murtad, this is real. This is not yeah, some yeah. kind of metaphorical yeah. kind of thick fear. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, unfortunately, in some places, the state of our ummah. Alhamdulillah, in many places, uh, this is not the case. But the point I want to make is there is a fitna that inverts our priorities. Yeah. So that instead of um, hating those people who are Islamophobic, who are hurting Muslims, who are attacking Muslims, who are conspiring to kill Muslims, and literally Muslims, particularly in India, as we know, are on the verge of another uh, uh, mass slaughter. Uh, they are far away. So instead of hating them, what one feels psychologically, one feels greatest hatred against people who are very close to you, and then they disagree on a small thing. That becomes a much more personally felt sense mm. of personal hatred. Whereas if somebody is just in a different class, then, you know, there's a, a story that um, uh, it's a saying I read from, uh, that it's from Bosnia, Allah knows, mm. that a farmer does not hate the feudal lord that has a thousand cows, but he has one cow and he hates his neighbor or his cousin who has, who has a cow and a goat. Yeah. That's his real competition because the other people are out of, outside his class. They may be the one who are taking his cattle. They may be the one who are his real competition mm. or his real cause of misery. But I am going to compare myself not to that big lord, right? Uh, I'm going to compare myself to a poor guy who are struggling Social with Social comparison is stratified, for sure. Exactly. It is, it is. Uh, That's why the hadith scholars uh, often say, Al-Mu'asaratu Hirman, Kalam Al-Aqran, Yutwa Wa La'Urwa, that uh, Mu'asara, being contemporaries of each other, is a source of deprivation. Because there's the human element, there's sort of the following, there's the cult. The scholars, at the end of the day, are scholars. They're not prophets. Human uh, They are better than us in aggregate, but they are still human. Uh, and they, they say the, just the other sort of principle uh, that I shared to translate it quickly, Karam uh, al that the peers, their statements meaning about each other, yutwa wa la is supposed to be folded away and not circulated. No. It should not be circulated. It's Sheikh, you know, critical I, safe now. So. Yeah. Uh, there is something very operative you said that I wanted to probe further, uh, especially for practicality in our context as Masajid Islamic centers, Muslim minorities in the diaspora in general. Uh, he checked first, like, are you Hindu or Muslim? But is there like a textual? Because pre- you, you're saying there's a there's a bottom line, but there's also like a, a 
but there is a gradient in Islam. Like we do consider certain things, you know, off limits when they violate like scholarly agreement or something. But let's imagine even a, 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 a violation of ijma, something that's, you know, uh, unanimously agreed upon between Muslim scholars. Uh, someone violates that easiest example. Someone's a, a Hindu, someone's a Jew, someone's a, a Christian. Uh, is there a gradient that even moves beyond the, the fold of Islam itself? Is there, does that exist in our tradition? Is yes. there room for unity with even non-Muslims? I think as, the, as an analog, if you are, if yes, I mean, I would imagine yes, then within the ummah becomes min babi awla by greater priority. It just, it's an automatic. It should be a no-brainer for us if we understand these things. Absolutely. So if you look at the Sharia, Ahl al-Kitab, people who are closest to us, mm. they share in their in interpretation of la ilaha illallah, not in Muhammad Rasulullah, right? We could have become their number one enemies, but we don't. Mm. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors them in the Quran. And despite, of course, uh, with the Ahl al-Kitab, with the Yahud in Medina, there were uh, uh, there was a lot of and they felt this precisely this way toward Muslims. That's the odd thing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran, in Surah An Nisa, Allah mentions how they are going and allying themselves to the people of Mecca, the pagans, idol worshippers, and telling them, amanu sabila. They are better than the believers. They knew that these what Muhammad sallam is teaching is so close to what they're teaching. It's precisely this phenomenon because they made of which it a bigger threat than the idol worshiper. Exactly, they hated this more than, and they were making a deal with. The, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't return that. Doesn't right? let us reciprocate that. Sentiment. Doesn't re let, let us reciprocate. Exactly. But rather, we can marry their women and we can eat their food. But that means we can socialize with them, mm. right? And then, of course, later, this is an honor that Allah gives to the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. It is as if Allah SWT is teaching that people who agree with you in La ilaha illallah, they have a concept of the book, they have a concept of al-akhirah, they may have corrupted it, they may have forgotten about it, parts of it, but still, they are close to you. So you honor that by having special laws and norms and openness to the people of the book. And later, of course, with even Jews or Zoroastrians, they are accepted as... Uh, part of the dhimma, uh, like Ahl al-Kitab, but still when it comes to marriage and comes to eating meat and so on, those norms honor Ahl al-Kitab because they at least share that. So as you said, absolutely, in Bab Awla that we honor, it is a fortiori that we honor anybody who says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, unless they're violating some fundamental part of it or deliberately hurting us. Uh, in evaluating whether somebody is deliberately hurting us, you have to be honor. You have to be honorable and just and truthful. Uh, I have seen, for example, on all sides, I'm saying whether it's uh, uh, Sunnis and Shia. In this case, for example, people uh, misrepresent each other's history, right? And I have seen good people uh, among the ulama, academics, who honor and truthfully relate and acknowledge the other side. Um, it is often said, for example, I'll, I'll just lay it out, that the Shia are always betraying the Ummah, betraying the Sunnah. Right? And the example that is given is this vizier uh, of uh, Abbas Khalifa al-Alqami, who was involved in inviting uh, the Mongols to Baghdad. This is true. Historically, there are reports, nobody denies that. However, if you look at the context, just before this happened, there had been riots between Shia and Sunnah. And so the Shia hurt the Sunnah, and Sunnah went and burnt down the neighborhood of the Shia. So this guy, he's a Muslim, and he's a vizier. Uh, so it's not like they're all constantly an enemy, each other's enemies, but he is uh, driven by this animosity, that, animosity mm -hmm. that is very personal, right? But at the same time, I'll give you an example of what happens in the Crusades. When the Salajika, the Saljuk princes, when they are being attacked, when they are running away, um, 
among the ulama that are calling these Sunni princes to come and fight and defend are 12 verse Shia scholars. In fact, one of the earliest ones that I could find that they believe in the Shaddad, mm. uh, I don't forget, uh, I forget now the whole uh, the context. He is a Shia alim. And for the Abbasids, when Abbas were Sunnah, the dynasty or the, the, the people that defended the Byzantine border, the Hamdanids, were Shia, 12 verse. So we have examples on both sides and of both kinds. And today, if you look at the Shia and Sunnah, who is pal who's, who's supporting the Palestinians? It's, it, let's not kid ourselves. So we have had... There are, you mean that there are sort of many or probably the most prominent uh, shameful political positions on Palestine today are coming from Sunni nations. Coming from people who call themselves Sunnis. And it's the Houthis who are Zaidi uh, and Iran. Regardless, you, people are gonna, people feel very offended about Iran. I do too, but what happened in Syria, I, this is not easy. But, but fair, is fair. fair is fair. Fair is fair. And what right. the Houthis are yeah. doing, nobody else is doing. May Allah reward them and may Allah unite us, but we have to be truthful. Yeah. You know, the, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's a long dua, of course, but part of it is, وَأَسْأَلُكَ كَلِمَةَ الْحَقِّ فِي الْغَضَبِ وَالْرِضَى oh. oh Allah, I ask you to guide me to say, you know, the precise truth, whether I'm pleased or displeased, whether it's sort of in my favor or in the favor of my camp, because at the end of the day, my camp is me, right? It's ego and it's concentric circles. Yeah. Uh, SubhanAllah, that's uh, very operative for us. You know, the I remember uh, being blown away by Ibn Taymiyyah, to be honest, rahimahullah, when, when he says that this is like a near ijma, however, there are scholars, and he'll cite Sunni scholars that have technically qualified for the rank of ijtihad uh, that preempted or sort of like uh, uh, hindered the ijma. And it's just like, wait a minute, but like, why would we consider, in my sort of primitive head, like, why would someone not from Ahl Sunnah, like, be considered? Uh, why would they get to, to veto the Ijma'ah, basically? Uh, and at the end of the day, it's about Insaf. Mm -hmm. You know, your Ijma'ah, the doctrine of unanimity, is about a Muslim scholar. So if he's Muslim and he's a scholar, then so long as there's no precedent to bar them, uh, they technically qualify. It's hard for people to do that, right? To hold a, a single metric, a metric of justice across the board, whether it's your side or the other side. And the other thing, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, you know, he, he, he mentions that in the discussions on hajr, boycotting, and I know sort of boycotting may be a little bit of a different issue, but it's related, that boycotting a Muslim uh, is impermissible by scholarly agreement except for a clear benefit. Right. And so it's not even about how much of a violation is. It. Is there a benefit, right, in boycotting this particular Muslim? And that, in my head, also makes things rather simplistic, like the the challenge at hand, whether it's Palestine or legislations against Islam and Muslims here in the States or otherwise, they don't differentiate between like Sunni, Shi'i, a lot of times Ahmadi. When that when the attacks the Islamophobic attacks happened after you know certain events 9/11 or 10/7, there were Hindus attacked under the presumption that they were Muslim. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so uh, that's why I wanted that non-Muslim question. Like we can technically even put our hands together for the common good with someone who interprets La ilaha illallah differently, who disagrees on Muhammad Rasulullah categorically, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so from there, Sheikh, I think there's an apprehension. So that's the guilt factor. I hope we've remedied a little bit of it here. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left of, am I doing something fundamentally wrong? Islamically, no. There's people of the book. There's sort of unity on common good with whoever is willing. Uh, but then there's the second part of this is people have the apprehension that if I do, is there really, really a greater benefit than harm here? And I get it. Sometimes it's hard, but there are many people who believe any uh, iteration of unity, of putting our hands together, of united front, will automatically blur the lines. Mm. And I think that needs to be challenged, right? Yeah, like so if this, this sheikh idea... and that sheikh share a panel, then this sheikh has endorsed everything that sheikh ever said, or my community is going to be utterly confused. 
right? Have you come across this, Sheikh? Yes. So this idea of blurring the line um, that, um, you know, it's, it's this assumption of purity. But you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, first of all, there is a principle when you're dealing with, especially with non-Muslims on it for a just cause, is the principle of Hilf al-Fudul. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Medina that, you know, before even Risala, uh, there's something that occurred in Mecca that if it were to take place, I would be, uh, I would welcome that call. And that was to just for justice. To be basically a co-signatory. Uh, yes. Proverbially or figuratively speaking. So that means when it comes to a common cause for justice, that is our uh, asl that nobody can challenge. Oh, this is part of Islam. But there is a um, you know, presumptive unity and solidarity that comes with anyone who says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Right? And that goes for uh, the Shia, Sunnah, the Khawarij or Ibadis and that goes in modern differences as well the modernist Muslims and reformist Muslims and if they say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah how can you if, if you see a modernist Muslim right somebody who perhaps has different views on things that you really feel very strongly about you can oppose them if they are trying to, let's say they're trying to pass a legislation that will harm uh, the health of the society, such as this LGBTQ business that was taking place. You can oppose them on this. You can warn them on this. You can go and give da'wah to them, make things clear to them, and when that doesn't happen. But still, at the end of the day, they are Muslim. There are certain rights and duties that unless they have violated something, like if they say, yes, I know God says so, but I disagree with it, that, that means they become different, right? That's no longer, but nobody does that. They've Almost effectively, nobody. expressly opted out of Islam. Right. right. Yeah. But that's not what people that's do. People one, are disagreeing yeah. about what is right, and sometimes their disagreement goes deep. Sometimes their misguidance goes deep. Okay? I'm not going to say that they're all equal, but despite that, you come and pray together. There are certain rights. If they pray, you don't. There is nothing that you have on you on, on that on them that says they are munafiqeen. That's the only exception. You may not pray their janazah, the Rasulullah But that knowledge we don't have. Yeah. And even if you know munafiq died in Medina, Rasulullah would appoint someone else to make to pray janazah. They didn't prevent that from, from happening. So the point is that the rights of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah are established and to do otherwise is to come under the purview of the Qur'anic condemnation that the how people before us went astray is because of this baghi against each other. Once the bayinat, the signs were made clear to them, then they fell into Baghi. Baghi did not come before, but after they became people of Scripture, after they uh, knew Tawheed. So this is a temptation. And we should actively work. This is a matter of our spiritual integrity. And this idea that, you know, if I sit with somebody, it may be, it may be, I'm not saying this is a matter of strategy, that's why we can't make yeah. general statement. It may be that this is a function in which my sitting with somebody would make a statement that I know is harmful for Islam, that will confuse people, then that's a judgment. That's a judgment call. That's a matter of siyasa. One should actually be clear that sometimes my difference with another believer is in judgment, in siyasa, management of mm. appearances, management of emotions. And I may disagree with them, but I cannot even say that they are somebody who ch chooses a different siyasa, mm -hmm. a different political opinion, is in violation of right. uh, or committing a sin. I can't it's even say that. discretionary, so you should not yes. uh, make your, an accusation against someone's religious commitment on the basis of that. You right. agree with that right. framing? Right. Okay. Absolutely. So uh, a lot of times people do not know the difference between a hukum shara'i mm. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made something clear, hmm. the ulama agree, and the evidence is clear, versus something I know we agree that this is this is it, but whether I should go sit with somebody or not, okay, that's completely a matter of hmm. siyasa. It's a matter of discretion. And I will sometimes fight with somebody who does this, but ally with some somebody who is violating hukum shara'i or even is an enemy, uh, maybe in some ways of for Islam or or in other ways somebody who is completely uh, neglectful or neglectful of uh, of of Islam and piety and so on. Mm. But I feel much more strongly somebody who disagrees with me on this siyasa because that has become my cause. And so that that's when we have to really check ourselves. No, fantastic, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. You know, I recall the uh, Sheikh Abu Saq al Hawaini, Hafidahullah, great hadith scholar. And Allah give him health and long life and I mean, grant us all a good end. A uh, famous uh, student of uh, Sheikh Al Bani, um, he, he says when we went to prison in the 90s, he had a few sort of bouts with uh, sort of uh, prison. Uh, in Egypt, uh, mostly in the Mubarak era. And he said that we went into prison and we ran into a bunch of people that were takfiri. They were sort of uh, uh, trigger happy with the excommunication thing for those unfamiliar with the terms. And he said that, like, we said, okay, let's talk about it. Like, <laughs> like no, you're kafir. We're not talking about it. We don't sit with a murtad, you know, like an apostate. He said, listen, man, I got convicted to prison for my deen. And I'm still like a sellout. Like I'm still uh, like we're in it together for the same reason. Like give me some sort of slack, enough slack to have a conversation about this, about the actual misconception. He said, and they kept refusing. They said, no, when we get out, when we, when we get our books, basically, they said, we need our references. We're not mm-hmm. going to debate you here on the fly. And he's a big, big scholar. You know, obviously they were intimidated. He says, and then just to show you how childish it can become, because that's the thing. Like when even when parents get childish, the kids suffer for a lifetime. Sometimes even people in places of leadership, they just have these phobias, right? And this childish behavior towards each other, insecurity that uh, makes them unprincipled. And it's so damaging. Like he said that we weren't even able to pray jama'ah together anymore. He said the man used to turn around after iqamah. SubhanAllah, Sheikh, I, I, if it weren't Sheikh Abu Saq who said this, and I know him, he's not the type to exaggerate, uh, I would never have believed this. He said he turns around the imam and he says to us, لا يصلي خلفي ماسح. Anyone who wipes on their sock should not is not allowed to pray behind me, and it's just like what in the world? Like that should be the other way around. Like if I had some like position about wiping not being allowed, I should be worried about the imam invalidating my prayer. But you're the imam. Like what do you? But this is these are these cycles of uh, of just insane sectarian conflict that justify sort of the the most nonsensical behavior. Sheikh, I had a very important question to me, and I hope maybe to some of the imams and leadership and masajid in general. Someone just asked me a similar question. Uh, I'll divide it into two parts. The management of a masjid or the religious leadership of a masjid has constituents that want a certain something, an event, a certain type of event, uh, that they're not comfortable with in terms of their their training, their conviction, sort of their orientation, their ideological uh, orientation. What would you advise them? Like, I have a group who wants to invite a particular speaker that I don't really agree with, or even easier, um, hold a certain event, certain festive event, you know, Islamic calendars and otherwise that could be sort of uh, disputed among scholars, uh, how permissible they are otherwise, the mawlid or anything of this nature, the sara'ul mi'raj, things of this nature. Uh, what would you advise this management or this sheikh to do when you have people in your community, a sector of your community that want this? That's that's a difficult question, Sheikhna, because um, it can. What I would, uh, what I'm willing to do, that's because of my fiqh, not because I think it's the right answer. Mm. If somebody comes and says there's Mawlid, and the Mawlid, we understand what Mawlid is. It's a celebration of Rasulullah Sallallahu uh, Alaihi birth, and it is pra- his praise, but we're not going to do anything that is bid'ah, within, no. except that we're going to praise. And I know that these people do not have another masjid, and I uh, do not see 
anything wrong in what they are specifically what they are doing. They are going to talk about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're going nice. to praise Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're going to do dhikr. Um, I do not have a problem with that. Would you recommend uh, that the masjid sort of uh, approve this event in the name of the masjid? Or perhaps, as I've heard from others, create a space within the masjid for like non-masjid branded, non-masjid endorsed functions that will happen? We'll leave room for whoever wants to, but we ourselves are not going to be the ones uh, owning the function. Do you, yeah. think, do you think that's justifiable Islamically to give room to your constituents that want a certain something that's within a legitimate, excusable difference of opinion? So let's say generally, if mm. something is, there is ikhtilaf of ulama. In this case on Mawlid, obviously, Definitely. as you know, there is mm. ikhtilaf among legitimate ulama. For sure. And so in that case, I don't have a problem to begin with. Um, but if there is a an issue on which I feel or other people uh, feel strongly enough that look this is not mas'alat this is not matter of ijtihad ikhtilaf is beyond limits of ijtihad something that I would consider mm. crossing a boundary mm. then what do I do yeah. um, then I think that we have to look at masalih and mafasid there are cases, I'll give you an example, it's probably easier than doctrinal issues, which is somebody who, uh, one in which you expect that there is going to be some ikhtilat. Hmm. But these people, uh, it's not like they're Sort of socializing to, between non-mahrams is what you're referring to. Yes. Just to translate. Hmm. Yeah. And now I know in uh, student communities in particular, this whole generation, they think about uh, gender interaction very differently from the way I do and the way for people who are raised in Muslim cultures do. These people on the whole are trying to do good. If they don't do it here, they are likely to find places in uh, other venues that will draw drive them away from Islam. Yeah, the rise of the third spaces, they call it, right? Yeah, but uh, rise of the third That's spaces like ideal. <laughs> may have some benefit in that, may have some right? Benefit. It has benefit in that. You mean like the club. But I'm talking about they're close to the, uh, the, university, the university campuses. That's my that's in my mind. And they're going Purely to... Purely recreational, you're talking about. Okay, yeah. And it. they're going to hang out with people. They will not have any interaction with Muslims. Here, at least you can say, okay, you know what? Let's, let's put some limits and then we're going to pray and mm -hmm. some kind of limit. I will say, look at manfa uh, and mafsada. Look at benefit and harm, uh, rather than there being a hard line. But also, I want to make a more general statement that there are different ways of understanding a masjid. I mean, there's a, there is a masalla space, and then there is spaces that are attached to the masjid. Some people, some administrations, think of the masjid as entirely uh, like their. Entirely, every programming is their Equivalency in the sanctity. Every corridor, every adjacent room, it's yeah. all the same. Yeah, but also all the programming is theirs. Yeah. Whereas there is another model in which we are, we are taking care of the masjid and then we are providing this space to different Muslim groups. And some of them, you know, we are going to draw uh, broad boundaries. We're not going to cross certain boundaries, but other than that, you can do events in our masajid, so long as the event is good and it's within the matters of ijtihad, you can use it. And we're not even going to say that we, we don't own every event here. So that's a different model of thinking of the masjid. As and there should be no guilt, I think, for whoever is worried about like uh, compromise. You know, like you, you guys are always saying the benefit, the benefit. I, I think people just are really not good at calculating benefit and harm, and it's the toughest thing in the world to do. Yeah, because you got to be a, like a master of the text and the context. So that's why usually interdisciplinary studies are, are so needed, and that's why fiqh assemblies do what they do. But just on a, on a fundamental basis. Why, I, why I'm saying you shouldn't feel uh, compromised, religiously compromised, is because the scholars agree, as in way, and of course others mention, that wherever they disagree, you can't condemn. So you shouldn't feel like, oh, I need to be the gatekeeper here about this issue. If, if it's a matter of ijtihad, I mean scholarly independent sort of discretion or research or investigation, then we agree that we're allowed to disagree and we're not 
allowed to denounce, not allowed to condemn. So I think there's a lot of room there to work, especially considering what I believe are very clear masalih, very clear. You know, uh, I, I think you mentioned Bosnia and you reminded me, and uh, I'll stop talking here, but Sheikh uh, Yasir Birjas, hafizahullah, when he, when he finished his studies in Medina, and he was, mashallah, valedictorian of his class, um, he uh, went up to continue his studies with Sheikh Uthaymeen, uh, rahimahullah. And Sheikh Uthaymeen yeah. sent him among the people that went to Bosnia to sort of educate now. Uh, Islamic revival is happening, people coming back to the deen, they need a lot of educators. And he says, I used to feel guilty the entire year because he was raised in Kuwait. He's Palestinian, sort of displaced Kuwait, his family, very conservative upbringing. Then from there to Medina, so it's like an upgrade <laughs> in sort of the conservative culture. Uh, propriety, chastity, all of this, haya. He goes to Bosnia and it's completely, you know, ravaged by sort of the the communist scourge. And so he said, I felt guilty the whole year giving lectures to women without hijab and mixing in the gatherings and sort of like socializing between the lectures and all of this. Uh, like, I go back to uh, Arneza to study Sheikh Arthemi for the summer. I tell him, Sheikh, I can't handle it. The imposter syndrome is killing me. I feel so guilty. He said, why? He said, because there's, uh, their women aren't wearing hijab. He said, then put up a divider at least. Uh, he said, no, Sheikh, if we put up a divider, we've tried. They won't come. He said, well, what is the point of teaching Islam if they're openly in violation of Islam? Sheikh Al-Tamin said this to him, mm -hmm. talking about context. Uh, he said to him, what's the, no, Sheikh. He said, what are you teaching them? It's so important that you have to make these grieve, uh, egregious violations or condone them. Uh, he said to him, Sheikh, no, 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 zero like entry level sheikh we're talking about la ilaha illallah we're talking about nawaqib al-islam like how do you fall out of islam because like a lot of their culture is uh, uh you know knee deep in this stuff so sheikh Hathameen then stopped and he sort of he retraced everything he said that then who cares about hijab if you don't have tawheed mm. that's profound right like anything is up for a discussion if tawheed is on the line and i think that is the very real challenge yeah of you know, Muslims outside of Muslim majority lands, even a challenge somewhat in Muslim majority lands. What about in the belly of the beast? Yeah. Have is there anything else, Sheikh, we haven't discussed uh, that could be of benefit? A closing remark, an asiha, a dua, anything regarding unity, divisiveness, the duty of the hour. Zakamullah khair, you've covered everything. No, it is so much more. Inshallah, we get to have you for more. Amin ya Rab. So I think that in general we should think of our masajid particularly to Muslims in the West, in the West as um, grounds where we can experiment with the unity that we need in the Muslim Ummah and that requires um, a visionary leadership where we should think of our masajid as not our social playground we should think of them as an amana, first of all, for the ummah, uh, for our youth. And uh, we should uh, take, we should understand how deeply we injure Islam because of our egos. This is a very widespread problem, as I'm sure people are aware of this unmasked movement or unmasked as a phenomenon, maybe not a movement, but mm -hmm. a natural phenomenon Absolutely. that happens. Of course, there is a lot of blame to go around on all different sides, so I'm not going to say that it's always the board that's wrong, or the imam, or the, the attendees, or the young people. But um, understand that your ego can destroy masajid, can affect an entire generation. I have seen this, that because of people's uh, personal differences. They think that I, I opened the masjid, I paid for it, I own it. Not true. You lost control of the masjid the minute you established the masjid. You had a choice to donate or not donate. Yep. Once you donate it, now it belong, it's baytullah. It's no longer your bayt. Try to understand that, that you become bound by certain responsibilities. And one of them is to bring people in, particularly those who don't have uh, any other way out. For a lot of people, especially the first generation Muslims, may think they don't have anywhere else to go. They're going to go to the masjid. That's where they're going to socialize. These are the young people have a lot of other places to go. For them to come to the masjid, they're going to need more. Hmm. 
So you, every masjid should become like uh, Sheikh Muhammad's masjid that is open to the youth. That's not the case with most of our masajid. Uh, Yaqeen has published uh, Imam's report, which is really, really wonderful. The first step in the right direction where we are educating ourselves about the needs of our imams. Inshallah, we hope we'll have more uh, with the help of uh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad. But uh, I say this to the boards and to the people who are in the masjid, not even in the board. Think of yourself as hosts in the masjid, in the, in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People who brought me to the masjid and made me love the masjid were people precisely like that, who were not, you know, who were just hosts in the masjid. They would smile to people. Uh, I remember some very dear brothers uh, who would not want me to name them, so I will not, but I remember a very dear Sudani brother uh, and, and some others who made masjid a beloved place to me. So I w started to go to the masjid and when I came to America, I, uh, uh, I moved into a masjid as a graduate student and lived in the masjid because the masjid was the place where I found the best people with good akhlaq, people I can talk to who were intellectually intriguing, but they were just good people. And so you can make people fall in love with the masjid with your akhlaq uh, and consider this part of your mission, whether you are in the board or not whether you're imam or youth director, uh, that bringing people to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your mission. And I'll end with this uh, beautiful uh, saying that I've heard uh, from some of the great ulama as the, the mission statement of a believer. A believer is al-ladhi, al-mu'min, who al-ladhi yuhabbibin nas ila Allah wa yuhabbibillah ila nas That you make people beloved to Allah and you make Allah beloved to the people. How do you make people beloved to Allah? By introducing them, right, um, of Allah. So you, you, you think of your business as creating this love between people, no matter who they are, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you think of that as your mission, then uh, other things become easier. Jazakallah yeah. May Allah carve for us a place in that mission. Amin ya Rabbi. And make it solely for his sake and not deprive us of the reward of that. Is that khairan? I mean, yeah. uh, I pray this episode was helpful for everyone in, in realizing the the weight of the amana that we shoulder, whether we like it or not, simply by being present in the masajid and being contributors, even as congregants uh, or volunteers or leadership in these masajid. Uh, may Allah help us do right by it and uh, be dignified on the day we stand in front of Allah because Allah of how we, uh, how we carried it. Allahumma ameen. Please leave your comments. Uh, and your requests and your feedback because we are trying to refine this program, this podcast uh, with every brand new uh, release. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.